What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. In September of last year, I took on the catch em all challenge in Pokemon Black and White, and although I've uploaded a few catch em alls since then, all of you have been asking for me to check out the 6th generation. And today we're going to do just that. Today we're going to find out how easy you can catch every Pokemon in Pokemon X and Y. Considering that this is, I think, the ninth video in the series, most of you by now probably know what this challenge is all about. But as always, I have a playlist that you can check out in the top right of your screen to better understand what we're trying to accomplish here. Regardless, let's check out the rules before we take on the challenge. The first rule is that to play both copies of Pokemon X and Y. Once again, we only have two games rather than three to play, so we're going to split the allowed time for each game to 12 hours apiece. This is obviously for entertainment purposes, but I also want to show off which games can be more beneficial to grab specific Pokemon. The second rule is that we have to obtain each individual Pokemon, and by the end of it, there should be a complete living dex of all the new Pokemon available in the Kalos region. The third rule is that no glitches can be used. At this point in the Pokemon game timeline, glitches are few and far between, so this would be a pretty easy one to avoid. Before the video starts, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe for more content like this, as these videos take a lot of time to put together. And with that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. Now, if you've been following my journey of completing this challenge in every mainline game, you're probably wondering, what took you so long? And that's a completely fair question. I actually started this challenge all the way back in March of this year, and I was pretty confident that I was going to have this done within that month. After recording part of Pokemon X, I woke up the next morning and tried to put my micro USB cable back into my 3DS capture card, and... Well, I broke it. Because I can't solder to save my life, I had to send my capture card all the way back to the manufacturer to have it fixed, and because this also happened during the initial wave of the current state of the world, it took quite a while for it to come back to me. During that time is also when I started routinely streaming on my Twitch channel, and I kinda lost track of time. So what I'm trying to say is that I apologize for such a long wait. On the upside, I'm already working on Sun and Moon, so you can expect that sometime in the near future. Now I know it's pretty easy to poke fun at Pokemon X and Y, and assume that this challenge will be the easiest yet because the Kalos region has the least Pokemon to date, but ever since the 3DS Pokemon games came out, the stories became slower and slower, so if you're assuming I'm going to complete this in like 4 hours a game, you're going to be a little disappointed. After completing all the main intro stuff, our journey begins in Vanneville Town, where we're woken up by being literally attacked by a bird, and then say goodbye to our mom before meeting our friends outside. From here we can head to Aquacord Town and we're immediately able to pick out our starter. Now normally I have a specific Pokemon that I pick for these games, but it's important to consider that these games are pretty much the start of the new experience share, which gives your whole team experience rather than just picking one from your team. This means that as long as we have a pretty diverse team, we should have a balanced team the entire way through, so none of these are really a bad choice. In Pokemon X, I chose Chespin and named it Ray Flyer after the top comment in the black and white video. And if you'd like to be named after a starter for the next video, leave a comment down below what your favorite Kalos starter is. For Pokemon Y, I chose Froakie and named it Guild Games, which means that the Fennekin line will have to come from another game, but we'll get back to that later. Heading back to our house, we let Professor Sycamore hit on our mom before reaching Route 2 for yet another catching tutorial. These games were also the first to make all encounters in the first route to have a 100% catch rate. And this also applies for the Santaloon Forest up ahead. This is really helpful considering that there are quite a lot of Pokemon that we're going to have to catch, so thankfully we won't run out of Pokeballs. Here we can catch 3 Fletchling, 3 Scatterbug, and Bunnelby, which brings the total to 5 Pokemon. Because Y has to catch a majority of these Pokemon, let's focus on X for a little bit. After quickly making our way through the forest, we reach Santaloon City, and in pretty much only 10 minutes, we're able to take on the first gym. Before we do that, we have a battle against the Roller Girl in the front of the building, and once we win, we're given the Roller Skates. Are these the worst and most uncontrollable form of movement in any of the mainline Pokemon games? Yes. Are they annoying because they're tied to the circle pad, which is also a pain to control in general? Yes. There isn't an upside here. After following some water droplets, we can reach the end of the gym and take on Viola. Although we're technically at a disadvantage here, having access to Rollout makes this battle a breeze, and with that, we've claimed the first badge. Upon leaving the city, we meet Viola's sister, who gives us the experience share, so from now on, all the Pokemon in our party are going to be earning XP at the same time. Heading through another route, we're introduced to Lumio City, which is essentially the hub to the Kalos region. For now, we're unable to access the whole area because there's a power outage in the tower, even though everywhere else has power for some reason. So for the time being, we can head to the Pokemon Lab and take care of some more of the story. Here we meet Professor Sycamore and we're challenged to a quick battle against all the Kanto starters. Once we defeat him, we're able to pick one of the three. Although they probably won't get much use, it's good to have some form of type coverage for a starter before we have a strongly built team. After meeting up with the rest of our friends, we head into the one of the cafes and meet Diantha and meet another character that definitely doesn't look evil in the slightest, and we can head to Route 5 to progress further into the story. 
If you haven't noticed by now, we've caught basically nothing in this game so far. This game is going to be the one that makes the most progress in the story, and Y is going to be the one to collect pretty much all the early game Pokemon to balance it out. Around this time, Y is just beating Viola because a butterfly somehow gave us like 10 minutes of trouble, and we've made our way to Lumio City to complete the same events. Heading into Route 5, we're stopped by a Lucario and meet Corinna, who is a gym leader in the later half of the region. After a quick conversation, we're able to roam about and grab some new Pokemon. Here we can get two Skiddo, two Pancham, and Furfru. This route ends up leading to Camp Freer Town, where we can find a wild Snorlax blocking the bridge that we need to cross to progress. We're instructed to go to the mansion up the road to collect the Poke Flute needed to wake it up. During all of this, we find out the owner lost his own Furfru, and we spend a few minutes catching it. Because they were so excited that they found their own dog in their own backyard, the owner set up a fireworks show in the middle of the day to celebrate. I really don't understand this story. Once we bring the Poke Flute back, we're able to move past the Snorlax and reach Route 7. We have another meetup with all of our friends, which led to one of my Scatterbug evolving all the way to Vivalon, but also in the flowers we can catch two Spritzy before making our way to the cave. While this is going on, X caught two Esper and three Hone Edge outside of the mansion, and grabbed Swirlix and three Fulbebe on Route 7 before rushing all the way to Ambret Town. This is a location where we can get the TM for Rock Smash, which is required for a few encounters later on in the story. After talking to the scientists in the lab, we can head to Route 9 to take a scenic ride on the Rhyhorn to the Glittering Cave. Now I haven't mentioned this at all up until this point, but this run had some seriously bad luck. I've run into like 3 accidental battles and spent an absurd amount of time trying to catch Hone Edge, to the point where Y is about 2 minutes away from being on the same pace. If you ever watch a speedrun of these games, you know that a good speedrun trick is to run into Glittering Cave with only your starter, and if you get poisoned and knock yourself out after completing the events, you won't have to ride the Rhyhorn all the way back. Because I wanted to make some time back, I tried to do this with zero practice and ended up getting destroyed by the grunts within the cave. This sent me all the way back to the Ambret Pokemon Center, which means I had to take even more time to get back. This is the point in the run where Y is ahead for the rest of the playthrough, but just like any of the other videos I've done, I'll keep you in the loop as to how we're doing later on. As we make our way through the glittering cave, we meet a scientist at the end that lets our rival and us pick out one of the two regional fossils. For this game, I'm going to pick the Sail Fossil. Once we get back to Ambret Town, we're able to revive it into Amora. Heading north of here, we can head through the lower section of Route 8 and reach Silage City. If you go into the bike shop, we can finally get rid of the worst movement option in history and exchange them for the worst bike in history. Our next objective is taking on the gym, which is pretty straightforward if you know what you're doing. During the battles, both of my Fletchling evolve into Fletchender. Grant is probably one of the more difficult gym leaders that you have to take on in this playthrough, as he has access to a Dragon-type Pokemon, which probably resists everything that you've trained up at this point. This took a couple of attempts because my team was pretty unbalanced, but with a little luck I was able to take out his team of fossils and claim the second badge. Heading north of the city is Route 10, and this is a pretty important location for our encounters, as Halucha can help carry us through all of the battles until we have a fully built team. This isn't mandatory because we won't need it for too long, but considering that it is a new Pokemon added to this region anyways, we're going to have to grab it at some point. After taking on some of the grunts on the route, they lead us to Geosenge Town, where we meet our rival and have a battle with Corinna, and she mentions that we should meet her in Shalor City to challenge the gym. Heading into Reflection Cave, we have a few quick battles before reaching the city with our friends. They mention that the Mega Evolution Guru is at the giant tower at the end of the city, and we head there to learn everything that we can about it. After we fight our rival to prove our worth, we're told to go to the gym to take on Corinna. Overall, this isn't too difficult of a gym, as Halucha takes care of just about every opponent without even taking any damage, and from here on out, the badges will only get easier to collect. After collecting the badge, we can head back to the tower and talk to Corinna again. She gives us the Mega Bracelet for defeating her, and we're tasked with battling her again with her own Lucario. Although this Pokemon isn't part of this gen, its stats are so ridiculously high when it Megas that it would be dumb to not use it. From the start, its move pool combats nearly every Pokemon that the Team Flare Grunts have, with the only exception being Golbat, which we can immediately teach Rock Tomb to easily cover. Now that we've got our crutch for the rest of the game, we can collect the HM for Surf from our rival and head to Route 12. This route doesn't really contain too much, but it does give us access to Azor Bay through the northern exit, and there are a few Pokemon that you can only obtain in that area. As we're heading in that direction, X has made their way to Silage City and defeated Grant, and stopped on Route 10 to catch another Halucha and Eevee to evolve later on. On our way to Geosenge, Fulbebe evolved into Floet. After having a battle with Corinna, we head straight to Route 11 where we have to catch Dedenne. Now this Pokemon is only a 5% encounter, so it's not exactly the easiest Pokemon to find, but when I tell you that this run was cursed with endless bad luck, I'm not joking. This hunt took me exactly 21 minutes to find one. 
The worst part is that aside from Friend Safari, there is literally no other option that you can find them, so I just had to encounter it over and over until one appeared. In hindsight, I should have had a Pokemon with Static to increase my chances, but the odds weren't even that bad, so I just assumed beforehand that it wouldn't have been an issue. Because I was ridiculously behind at this point, I decided to skip some encounters to make more progress. After completing the events in Shalor City, we can make our way to Kumarine City and take the monorail down to the southern section. In this area, we have another battle with our rival, and we can make our way through Ramos' gym to collect the fourth badge. Because nearly all the trainer battles in this gym are mandatory, Esper was able to evolve into Meowstic. This brings a total to 20 Pokemon. From here we can head south to have our Pokedex upgraded once again, and can venture into the desert to the Flare Hideout in the Power Plant. This is another one of those sections where you have to battle everyone in the area before you can progress, so this takes up a huge chunk of time. Thankfully though, Lucario can basically solo every battle without even needing to heal, so it's more so tedious than it is difficult. During these battles, my starter evolved into Chestnut, which also helps significantly as a backup Pokemon. After fighting the admins in the center of the facility, the power is restored to Lumio City, which means that the gym will now be available to take on. Thankfully, the southern exit of this area is a direct shot to the gym, so all we have to do is head down here and... Whoa. Tall. At this point, Y has caught two Inkei and two Binacle in the Azura Bay, and is already taking on the fifth gym. Considering that Lucario is still fighting, there really isn't any threat that we have to look out for, and we can slowly but surely make our way through the entire quiz. During this entire gym, I carried Inkei with me, which allowed for Pancham to evolve into Pangoro, as well as Frogadier to evolve into Greninja, and Fletchender into Talonflame. After claiming the badge, we meet up with Professor Sycamore and Lysander at his cafe, before heading straight to Route 14 to meet up with our old friends. Here we have a battle against our main rival before making our way through the bog. In the shallow sections of the water, we can catch Gumi, and thankfully, its evolution can be found much later, so we don't have to evolve another pseudo to an insanely high level. At the end of the route, we head into a haunted house and mash A for 20 seconds before being able to enter Laver City. The gym for this area is extremely similar to Sabrina's gym in Kanto, as you have to make your way through the teleporters to reach the gym leader. You can skip every trainer if you're careful enough, which can save a pretty crazy amount of time. After sweeping through Valerie's team, we can claim the 6th gym badge and make our way to the next event. You're probably thinking that the pacing for this video seems a bit fast, but that's just kind of how the storyline for this game goes. It's just so linear and you barely revisit an old location, so I'd much rather just get to the point than bore you to death with the really little details. In the back of Laver City is the Pokeball Factory, which is presumably overtaken by Team Flare. After distracting the guard, we're able to make our way into the building and slide under the conveyor belts to reach the hut in the far right. If you change the direction of the belts with the PC at the entrance, you can get through this area without fighting any of the grunts, which saves a pretty large amount of time. Inside the office, we had to fight the knockoff versions of the Team Galactic Commanders, and once we've cleared everyone out of the building, the CEO of the factory offers to give us a Master Ball for saving his business. This will obviously come in handy later on, but both games will use them very differently as you'll see in a bit. Believe it or not, at this point X is only 2 minutes behind Y, which is very surprising to me considering how garbage literally every part of this run has been. Maybe I'm really just that bad at playing Pokemon. Run number 20. Oh, yeah, maybe. After clearing out the factory, Hone Edge evolved into Deblade, and we made our way into Dendamil Town to meet up with the Professor once again. Heading north of here, we're told that there's a disturbance happening within the Frost Cavern, and we're tasked with heading inside to see what's going on. After struggling with the ice puzzles for 10 minutes, we reach the end and find Team Flare attacking Obama Snow, and we once again have to defeat them. After finishing up this quick event, we can escape Robata there and head east to Route 17 to ride a Mamoswine all the way to Anastar City. This is the location of the 7th gym, but just like many of the other games in the series, this is the point in the game where the climax of the story unfolds. Before we take on the gym, we have to battle our rival at the entrance, which is just as easy as it was the last 5 times. Although this gym contains a pretty large collection of trainers, if you know where you're going, you'll only have to fight one trainer right at the beginning, but even on your first time playing through, you probably won't have a problem avoiding the battles if you choose not to do them. The battle against Olympia is probably one of the harder gyms due to you not having any coverage moves with Lucario, but at this point, you should have a semi-decent backup team that can run through whatever Lucario doesn't obliterate. After taking care of that, we're told to visit the same cafe in Lumio City that we've been to like 6 times so far in the story, and to everyone's surprise, Lysander is the bad guy, and we have to stop him before he takes over the world. The battle that you have with him once you access his hideout is probably one of the most difficult battles that you'll face in this challenge, as it's really just because the increase in levels is creeping just behind what Lucario is currently at. 
This battle took a couple of attempts because Pyro would just deal way too much damage. So in the meantime, let's just check out how Y is doing. After completing the events of the Pokeball Factory, we're able to follow the same path and catch Klefki on Route 15 and two Bergmite in the Frost Cavern, which brings the total to 30 Pokemon. After defeating Lysander, he heads into the elevator. We have to make our way through the teleporting puzzles in order to get our own key. Although there are a few grunts that you can skip, a majority of the trainers that you see in the overworld have to be fought to progress. But thankfully, as always, Lucario takes care of whatever the rest of your team can. After an eternity, we can head into this little side room and battle Mabel, who upon defeat gives us the key to the elevator to chase after Lysander. Upon heading down to the basement, we find that he's captured old man Jenkins and tells us the story of the Pokemon War that took place 3,000 years ago. After AZ's Floette died in the war, a secret weapon was made to bring it back to life, only for his Floette to disappear, to which he hasn't seen it since. I mean, personally, I think he's overreacting a little bit. They're not really that rare. I can show you all the way to Route 5. They're like 20% in the purple flowers. From here, he takes us down to the basement basement, and we have another battle against the Team Flare admin before being forced to choose either the blue or the red button to stop the ultimate weapon. Because I figured that destroying the universe would make this catch em all go by a lot faster, I activated the weapon and created a giant crystal beam in the middle of Geosenge Town. From here, we can head all the way over to the town and access the Team Flare headquarters that's been hiding underground the entire time. During all this, Amora evolved into Aurorus, and Inkei evolved into Malamar after holding my 3DS upside down for an entire battle. Heading into the hideout, we have to fight Lysander once again, and somehow his team gained 3 levels from flying one place to another, but this is basically the same battle that we just took on. From here we can head into the basement and find what looks to be the power room for the headquarters. After defeating a horde of admins, we have the room to ourselves and accidentally awaken the legendary Pokemon for this version, Eveltal. Now like I mentioned earlier, the process for using the Master Balls we obtained earlier in the run varies depending on which one you play. For this game, we're just going to use it now because there really isn't anything better that we could use it on that we have planned for this game. In general, this isn't really a hard battle because its catch rate is boosted for being the main legendary in the game, so no matter how you approach this, you should be able to grab this beast in only a few Pokeballs. After adding it to our team, Lysander appears wearing GoPros and an Oculus Rift and challenges us to one final match to reclaim the legendary. After running through his team with Oblivion Wing, we've successfully completed the Team Flare section of the story, and believe it or not, this is basically the end of the road for this game. Because only one game needs to complete the story to collect every Pokemon, we only have to complete a few more quick sections before we can roam around the region and grind out the rest of our encounters. For now, let's just head back to Anastar City and- Tom? Heading south of the city, we reach Coraway Town and have a battle with Professor Sycamore before being allowed to reach Route 19. After the battle, Binacle evolved into Babaracle, and Skiddo evolved into Gogo. This brings us total to 35 Pokemon, and pretty much half of the new Pokemon introduced in the Kalos region. It may not seem like much, but it'll add up a lot in a second. On Route 19, we can meet our friends on the bridge, and they all force you to battle them at the same time for some reason, but if we also head into the shallow water here, we can catch two Slagoo, which is extremely good considering that it's only a few levels away from evolving. At the end of the route, we reach Snowbell City, which we're going to completely ignore and make our way to the forest to the south. After making our way through the maze, we reach the Pokemon Village, where we can catch Ditto for breeding. At this point, we're all done with making any progress with the story, so before we do anything more with this game, let's finish up the rest of X's story. With the cafe events taken care of, we're able to make our way to the headquarters and complete the events to take on the other box legendary, Xerneas. Like I mentioned before, I have bigger fish to catch later on, so the Master Bowl isn't an option but it only took me a few throws before I was able to complete this part of the storyline. After following the same path as Y, we reach the Pokemon Village and find the 8th Gym Leader Wolfric, who challenges us to take on the gym back in Snowbell City. Before we do that, we also have to grab a Ditto for breeding, which is the final Pokemon that we're going to catch before the postgame. As you'd expect, Wolfric's entire team is terrified of any Pokemon named Lucario, so the final badge in this game takes little to no effort to complete. From here, we can head east to reach the gates of the Pokemon League. After fighting a random guy to prove our worth, we're able to access the lengthy Victory Road. Once again, this is one of those places with tons of potential trainers, but if you're careful about it, you can avoid basically everyone up until the final stretch of the section. Halfway through, we have a battle against our rival, but since you get a free heal literally steps before you take her on, it isn't too difficult of a battle. Exiting Victory Road, we're immediately thrown in front of the Pokemon League, which is the only thing separating us from catching one single post-game Pokemon. Although we do have a full team, this league is pretty difficult for just Lucario to solo. This is kind of the point where I realized that I kind of screwed up the run in the long term because my team could barely handle a hit from any of the leaders. After defeating Elite Force Malva, Wickstrom, Drasna, and Cybold, we're able to take on the champion of the Kalos region, Diantha. 
This battle is actually easier than the Elite Four because I was able to set up with Lucario and run through her team. Like I said, I probably could have prepared for these battles halfway through the game and saved a lot of time by having a more diverse team, but with our weird team, we've successfully completed the main story of Pokemon X. But as you can see, the total is painfully low, so let's take on the most important and Pokerap filled part of the challenge, the postgame. Now, in hindsight, the layout for the objectives in each of these games are heavily lopsided, which you'll clearly see in just a bit. So if you want to follow along and do this for yourself, you'll probably want to tack on some more encounters onto this version to make it a little more fair. Starting out, we have to head all the way to the southern section of Route 16 to grab the Super Rod from the Fishing House, and if we enter from the northern side of the area, we can head into the tall grass to catch two Pumpkaboo. With both the Good and the Super Rod, we can head back to Silage City and fish for Skrelp and Dragalge, but it's also important to grab the Sachet from this house, as we'll need it for an evolution at the end. As I mentioned all the way at the beginning of the video, we're going to have to receive a Fennekin from another game in order to complete this challenge. So I traded one to this game to give it a little more work to do. Heading back to round 5, we can breed that and a few more Pokemon I need to finish off all the encounters for this section. After biking around for a bit, we can hatch our eggs to get two more Fennekin, two Froki, and Amora. Yep, that's, <laughs> that's basically it. Now let's check out what X has to take care of. After having the parade and waking up back at our house, we start our post-game journey by heading back to Ambrette Town to revive our Jaw Fossil into Tyrun. To help with the leveling process later on in the run, I also flew back to Kumarine City to grab a very important item. If we take the monorail to the north and head into this building, we can collect the lucky egg from this girl if we show our Pokemon with high affection. Now I would have done this in the main playthrough, but all of my team members were basically cannon fodder and were probably at zero affection in the majority of the playthrough. Now let's catch some encounters that we've skipped. On Route 9, we can catch Helioptile and Carbink in the Reflection Cave. During this process, I accidentally ran into a wild roaming Articuno, which is hilarious to me because I vividly remember having an absurdly hard time finding it when the game came out, but since it runs away on the first encounter, I didn't bother trying to catch it. Back at the beginning of Route 18, we can head over to this large entrance to access Terminus Cave. This area is home to two very special Pokemon, with one being much more difficult to find than the other. Throughout many of the routes and caves in this game, there are static random encounters, which are basically things like Pokemon jumping out at you from bushes and trees, or from the ceilings of caves. Terminus Cave is home to Noibat, which is arguably the hardest one of these encounters to find in the entire game. These encounter spots are few and far between, but if you enter and exit the stairwell and bike over to this incline, there's a good chance that there's a dark spot on the ground for an encounter. Now every website under the sun claims that this is like a 10% encounter chance to find Noibat, but if you look on any forum, literally no one agrees with it because of how many Ariados you have to run through to get one. This took me about 20 minutes to find one because of how long it takes to produce an encounter, but thankfully we can breed this rather than deal with hunting another one down. If you venture all the way to the farthest depths of the cave, we can enter a giant room. At the end of the area is the final legendary of the game, Zygarde. Because this Pokemon has a catch rate of 3, this is normally a very difficult Pokemon to grab, but since I haven't used my Master Ball yet, we can quickly pick this one up to finish off the area. To finish off the encounters, we can catch Diggersby and 2 Litleo on Route 22, Clauncher and Clawitzer in the Silage City, and 2 Phantup on Route 16. This brings the total to 51 Pokemon. To finish up preparing for the grinding section, we're going to grab the Dust Stone in Laver City, the Whip Dream and Shiny Stone by the Skiddo Ranch, and a Sunstone after trading the Story Item in Shalur City. Back on Route 5, with our breeding, we can finish off the rest of our work with breeding two Chespin, Noibat, Helioptile, and Tyrun. Now it's time to evolve all of our catches. When it comes time to grinding out everything, there are a lot of locations, and at the same time, like, zero locations to take care of this task. The Elite Four is too annoying to deal with at this level, but the wild encounters don't really give out all that much experience to get it done in a timely manner. Because at this point I was looking pretty good on time, I decided to just battle in the wild, but overall there isn't really a best place to finish off this section. After quite a few random trainer battles and encounters, we are able to level up our catches to get Scatterbug to Spupa, Fennekin to Bryxen, Froakie to Frogadier, another Bryxen to Delphox, Sligu to Gudra, and Bergmite to Avalug. This brings the total to 57 Pokemon. In Pokemon X we can evolve our catches to get Chespin to Quilladin, Flabebe to Floette, Tyrunt to Tyrantrum, Noibat to Noivern, Litleo to Pyroar, Hone Edge all the way to Aegislash with the Dust Stone, Helioptile to Heliolisk with the Sun Stone, and Floette to Florgas with the Shiny Stone. The final Pokemon that we're going to take on is probably the most annoying one of them all, Sylveon. 
In order to get this evolution, you have to get two hearts on your Eevee and Pokemon and me, and then evolve it when it knows a fairy type move. The process to complete this is basically this. Feed your Eevee treats until it refuses to not eat anymore. Play some mini games where you drag fruit around or solve a puzzle until it's hungry again. Feed it some more and then repeat. I looked everywhere online to find a fast method to evolve this thing and there was literally nothing available that was even slightly resourceful. I'm a firm believer that there has to be a faster method, but the way I did it took an absurd amount of time. Thankfully though, this is the last Pokemon for this game, so at the end of the day, I can't complain too much. To finish off the rest of the Pokemon, we're going to need to do some trading. If we trade Spritzy holding the Sashay and Swirlix holding the Whip Dream, we can get Slurpuff and Aromatisse. If we trade Phantup and Pumpkaboo, we can evolve them both to Trevenant and Gorgeist. This brings us to the 69 Pokemon, and all the Pokemon that are available in Pokemon X and Y. Well, there are a few more. So just like any other generation, there are mythical Pokemon that were released during the initial year of X and Y's release, and in total there were three that came out. Diancy, Hoopa, and Volcanion. Unlike the previous catch em alls that have done in the past, this was the generation that did away with the mythical in-game events, which means that all of these Pokemon were only available through either movie-related events, Wi-Fi distribution, or through local events at stores like GameStop. Although Gen 5 has a DNS exploit that allows you to get a few different extra Pokemon, these games don't have the backup servers to my knowledge, and there's a good chance that they probably never will. As of right now, there is no way to collect these, but I felt it was important to touch on them because they are Kalos Pokemon after all, just not ones that can be obtained within the mainline games at this point in time. And with that, we've successfully caught every currently available Kalos Pokemon in Pokemon X and Y. But how'd I do? So let's review. In Pokemon Y, I finished with a time of 8 hours and 14 minutes, and overall, I'm pretty happy with my time. A lot of time was saved due to the fact that I didn't need to take part in any of the story after the 8th gym, but I can safely assure that this can be done in a much faster time for even a casual player. There are so many big battles that took multiple tries, so this side of the game could be easily completed in probably 6 hours or less if you really optimize the routing. As for Pokemon X, I finished with a time of 11 hours and 45 minutes. Yeah, I wasn't kidding when I said it was lopsided. Not only was this run a complete disaster, but to make matters worse, this was my third attempt. 90% of the encounters took way longer than they should have, my entire team was underleveled, and I lost to nearly half of the big battles. I knew from the second hour in this run it wasn't going to be a good time, but I was genuinely curious as to just how bad this really could get if I pushed through with it. And well, I, I got exactly what I expected. Eliminating all the big mistakes, I'm sure this can be completed in like 7-8 to eight hours, but the grinding section of the Pokemon and me really bogged down the later half of the run. At the end of the day, I was able to complete the challenge and successfully redeem myself after Black and White, but I have a bad feeling that Generation 7 is going to be quite the trip. As always, if you're interested in doing this yourself, I've included the spreadsheet I used in the description below, and if you end up completing this yourself, tweet me your results at JohnstoneYT. Other than that, that's all there is to say about catching every Pokemon in Pokemon X and Y. And that's going to do it for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing, as I'll be making more content like this very soon. If you have any other suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. If you're interested in watching me take on challenges live, I've been streaming a lot over on my Twitch account, as well as upload highlights on my Johnstone Live channel that you can find in the description. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.